it's really a, a, a pleasure uh, for me to uh, to be hosting Stephen uh, Perlstein this evening. He's an old friend from our days together at the Washington Post, and I'm thrilled to have him at PNP for what is the first bookstock uh, bookstore talk about his just released work, "Can American Capitalism Survive?" Uh, it's a provocative, thoughtful, thoroughly reported, and engagingly written argument about the failings of our current free market system and, and how to fix them. Uh, as a columnist for the Washington Post, uh, Steve has faced a very big challenge, which is in a town that's often preoccupied with politics and sports, how to interest people in economics. Uh, but Steve has succeeded over the years with a, a writing style that makes the complicated understandable, the hidden exposed, uh, and the normally dry, actually entertaining. Uh, the Pulitzer Committee recognized Steve's talent a decade ago when it awarded him the prize for commentary for what it called, quote, insightful columns that explore the nation's complex economic ills with masterful clarity. Uh, in 2001, Steve added to his collection of honors, receiving the a Gerald Loeb Award for Lifetime Achievement in Business and Financial Journalism. Uh, one of my favorite columns of his, uh, which showed, among other attributes, his sheer nerve, appeared a year ago. Uh, headlined, Is Amazon Getting Too Big? It, it was splashed across the front of the Sunday business section of the Post, which, of course, is owned by Jeff Bezos. Uh, Steve's uh, piece was about the argument gaining ground in legal circles these days uh, that the U.S. government's approach to, uh, to antitrust is outdated, and woefully inadequate in dealing with tech giants such as Amazon and needs rethinking. Uh, and here's an interesting thing uh, to know about Steve's accomplished career. He's never really been formally trained for what he's been doing. Uh, he, makes, he makes this point himself in the acknowledgments of his book, recalling how in 1979 he wrangled his first business reporting job for a nightly news show on Boston's public TV station without ever having taken courses in business or economics. Uh, he's continued since then, then to, to learn from others, whether as a founding editor and publisher of the monthly Boston Observer, a senior editor at Inc. Magazine, or an employee at The Post, where he's worked for 30 years, first as a business editor, then as a reporter, and since 2003 uh, as an opinion columnist. Uh, he moved into academia in 2011, uh, again without the usual credentials. Um, <laughs> though lacking an advanced degree, he assumed a professorship in public and international affairs at George Mason University, where he's been teaching economics, poli politics, uh, public policy, and narrative journalism. Uh, in Can American Capitalism Survive?, uh, Steve explores why so many people have lost confidence in the ability of our economic system to raise living standards uh, and how greed has come to be glorified over traditional, such traditional American values as fairness and community. Instead of just focusing narrowly on such issues as tax rates, regulation, and government spending, where much of today's public debate has become so polarized, Steve encourages us to think more broadly to think more broadly about the kind of society we want and what reforms of our capitalistic system are needed to get us there. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Steve Perlstein. Thank you all for coming. I, I see a few familiar faces here. Um, these days I'm a professor, so uh, I have my notes, you know, my lecture notes. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to uh, uh, Bradley for that wonderful introduction and for in inviting me here. Um, uh, it's really good uh, to see a uh, former journalist finding uh, life-affirming, meaningful work, uh, even late in life. Uh, uh, they've, take the, they've taken a cherished institution, he and Lisa, and... Uh, and made it better, which is actually quite an accomplishment. Um, uh, I'm going to start by asking you to, to, uh, to answer a question. 
Um, and I'm going to ask you what your gut emotional reaction to what I'm going to say is. Uh, and think about your answer in terms of one or two words. I don't want to, I, I don't, I don't want a speech, just one or two words. What's your, just your first initial gut reaction, um, to a story, uh, such as this, that New York life, um, announced that it was going to lay off thousands of IT workers um, some years ago, uh, and it would give a severance to those workers, but the severance would be contingent on the workers training their Indian replacements who would come here uh, uh, to get trained. So what's your reaction to that? Just quick reaction. That's a bad idea. Bad idea. Outrageous. Outrageous, okay. Uh, what about this one? There was a big medical device company, actually there were several uh, big medical device companies uh, that renounced their U.S. citizenship uh, and became foreign corporations in order to reduce their taxes that they paid to the American government, the same government uh, that, for example, did the basic research for their products and educated their scientists and protects their intellectual property. So what's your, what's your reaction to that? Greed, okay. Well, what's your reaction to the fact that the Blackstone Group pays its chief executive, Steve Schwartzman, uh, well, last year did, and the year before that too, $800 million, which just, just to do a little quick calculation, is the same income that would be earned by about 15,000 elementary school teachers or about 12,000 uh, nurses. Uh, and he got that for basically being very clever at buying and selling companies and real estate. So what's your reaction to that? Obscene. Obscene. Okay. So we're at an inflection point in American capitalism. Um, our economy is actually really firing on all cylinders right now. We have close to 4% uh, growth in the last quarter. Um, the stock market and, uh, is at, real, at, uh, at all time high. Real estate prices are doing great. Uh, we have low unemployment and yet and yet half of millennials say they don't support capitalism. And 57% uh, of Democrats, that's most of you, I imagine. <laughs> Not you, John, but all of those guys. 57% of Democrats have a positive view of socialism. So that's partly because a lot of people are not sharing in the prosperity and their incomes have been stagnant. But what I want to focus on today is the other reason why this is happening is because people feel that American capitalism has run off the moral rails, that it's lost its moral legitimacy, that it's too unfair, that it rewards qualities like greed, selfishness, dishonesty, ruthlessness, indifference, and that it discourages things like empathy and compassion and generosity um, and cooperation. Over the last 30 years, we have basically been told to ignore the instincts that you had when I read you those things. That you've, we've been told that that's naive. Uh, and that if we, f if we acted on those instincts, it would be bad for our economy. And instead we based, we embraced a set of ideas that back in the mid-1980s and early 1990s were actually sort of useful because it was a time in which our economy had become rather uncompetitive. I don't know, you're all old enough to remember when we were worried about the Japanese threat and the threat from Europe. Um, well, that was, a, that was a very serious and real challenge to us. And so some of the ideas that we did embrace uh, were useful. Uh, and our economy did become much more competitive. Um, and those ideas have dominated uh, economic discourse and um, economic policy ever since that time. But they've been pushed to a point now and hardened that they've become a sort of ec a market fundamentalism. Um, and uh, it doesn't serve us well. So what are the ideas? I tried to think about that. I, you know, there's a lot of ideas around, but I tried to sort of encapsulate that and I came up with four. So the first idea was that greed was good uh, and that sort of pursuit of self-interest uh, is the essential ingredient of a market system, and which it is. It is an essential ingredient. 
and that this system over the years has lifted billions of people out of poverty since the Industrial Revolution um, and continues to lift billions of people out of poverty. The second idea was that the incomes that we earn in the marketplace, our market incomes, that's before taxes, um, are a reflection of our individual economic contribution. They are our just dessert. And that any attempt to redistribute that to those who are less talented or less deserving um, is something akin to theft. The third idea was that from a moral perspective, we didn't have to worry about inequality of income because that all that mattered, at least morally, was equality of opportunity. As long as everyone had an equal opportunity, you know, let the chips uh, fall where they may. Um, whoever wins the race wins. And the last idea that we, um, and, uh, we embraced, this is more of an academic idea, was that there is a trade-off between equality and efficiency, between fairness and growth, that we can have more of one or more of the other, but we can't, any efforts to make the slices more equal will make the pie smaller and make everybody worse off. There is a germ of truth to all of these ideas. And the reason that I wrote this book um, was to show that they have been pushed to such an extreme, however, that they've now produced a kind of capitalism that um, undermines our democracy, that routinely offends our moral sensibilities, and that underperforms economically. So let's take the first idea, which is the relentless pursuit of um, individual self-interest. Gordon Gekko's famous words from Wall Street, greed is good. Greed clarifies. Greed cuts through and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. That was meant, actually, uh, uh, to be a parody uh, in Wall Street. Uh, but in fact, it be sort of became an anthem uh, for a generation. Um, we're told that the roots of this idea come from Adam Smith and Charles Darwin. But it's a funny thing, if you go back and actually read Adam Smith and Charles Darwin, uh, you discover that these guys have been hijacked uh, by the market fundamentalists. Adam Smith's famous line uh, in The Wealth of Nations was, as you may recall, it's not out of benevolence that the butcher and the brewer and the baker deliver us our dinner every night, but out of their regard for their own interest. But here's what Smith wrote 18 years before that in the opening sentence of his other great work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there's a reason why we don't assign this anymore to undergraduates, how selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. That's Adam Smith. Smith is a brilliant and an insightful observer who had a nuanced appreciation of individual motivation and collective behavior. Economic man is not the self-regarding individualist who's conjured up by the market fundamentalist, but a sentient social animal whose wealth and happiness depend on the wealth and the happiness of everyone else. Darwin is associated with the idea of survival of the fittest, although he never actually used those words himself. His followers did. And the idea that any attempt to restrain the competitive behavior uh, and re redirect re rewards to the less talented would thwart what Gordon Gekko called the upward progress of mankind. But in The Descent of Man, Darwin writes that among the traits that were naturally selected were self-sacrifice, cooperation, altruism. It explains to him why families and tribes and nations, why some of those survive over others. Again, it's not a bad idea to read some of these old things. You can buy these here, right, at Politics and Prose, by the way. <laughs> 
there can be no doubt that a tribe, including many members who from, from possessing a high degree of the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, obedience, courage, and sympathy, and who were always ready to give aid to each other and to sacrifice themselves for the common good, would be victorious over most other tribes, and this would be natural selection. In other words, a cooperative gene exists side by side with our selfish one, and they together allowed human beings to become the dominant species. And in fact, that has been confirmed by some of the most recent work in psychology and behavioral economics and brain chemistry. We sympathize with those in need, and we take pleasure in helping them. We exhibit trust and loyalty, and we expect that to be reciprocated. And when they are not, we are outraged. We feel shame when we act too selfishly and pride when we do not. In other words, mor moral instincts are instincts. They're instinctual, they're emotional, and they're hardwired into our nature. As the psychologist Joshua Green wrote, our moral instincts to put us ahead of me are part of a successful evolutionary strategy for putting us ahead of them. The lesson from all this is that the species that emerge from the jungles and the savannas is a stubbornly social animal uh, with instincts for both competition and survival, but also cooperation. And in that, at an economic system that's based on the presumption that people act only on the basis of their greed and selfishness is no more likely to succeed than an economic system based on the presumption of sharing and kumbaya. We often hear business people say that markets are amoral and that we don't need to consider the morality of individual actions because the system as a whole is moral. That's because it's lifted billions of people out of poverty. But I'd like you to consider this experiment from two economists. I don't think either of them were Israeli, but they, they were living in Israel. Maybe you've heard about it. They both had young children, and so they were sending them to a daycare center. And the, day, uh, the daycare center was part of a chain. And the daycare center was having problems because parents were showing up late at the end of the day, and it was causing problems for the staff um, and for the children. Uh, and so they decided to do an experiment and they took half the daycare centers in the chain and in the half they started charging a fee for late pickup. It says here in my notes it was $3, but I think, I think it was actually $13, um, something like that. And in the other half of the, of, the, uh, of the chain, they didn't do anything different. And what happened? Well, at the chain where they charged the fee, the late pickup soared. Now, why was that? And the reason they reasoned was that what was once a moral obligation, you know, don't keep the staff there late, it's really insensitive uh, and selfish, was transformed into a commercial thing. I can buy my way out of that obligation. And so people, from time to time, bought their way out. And the funny thing is that when they realized this, and they realized that, that the experiment was a failure, they took the fee away, and it didn't reduce <laughs> the late fees, the late arrivals, because basically they had undermined the sort of moral basis for the transaction, for the commercial transaction. What, what this reminds us is that you need a high degree of cooperation and trust in a market economy. And as we get more complicated, you, we need more of that. And that those traits are reinforced by our moral instincts, the instincts that you had when I read you about those stories. The second idea is just dessert, um, that market incomes are an objective reflection of individual contribution. And economists have a word for that. They call it marginal productivity, which I won't try to describe why they call it that. But, um, well, is that true? Well, I'd like to illustrate why it's not with a simple, a simple analogy or a simple story. It's a made-up story, but not really. And it's about a barrel of tobacco. Um, 
Now, in the 18th century, uh, the person who owned a plantation on the James River and produced that tobacco and sold it in barrels and used the proceeds of those sales to pay all of the expenses associated with the plantation surely felt that at the end of that process, the money that he had left over was his just dessert. He earned it. He earned it in a competitive marketplace and it was his. And anyone who would take it away from him would be um, stealing. But over time, the profits from that barrel changed. They changed when we got rid of slavery, of course. They changed when we passed laws that says that sharecroppers had certain rights um, relative to the owners of the land. They changed again when we changed the minimum wage. They changed when it made it possible for the workers on that plantation to have unions. Every time we changed the rules, the marginal productivity of the market income of both the people who planted and picked the tobacco and the guy who owned the plantation, they changed. And we can see from that little example that all markets operate within a set of rules and norms and that those rules and norms are highly subjective. They're not objective. They're political. They're socially determined. And the implication of that is that if market incomes are in fact subjective and contingent, and they can change when you change the rules, then in fact there is nothing objective about what we earn. I could change the rules and instead of earning $800 million a year, Steve Schwartzman could earn you know, a mere $425 million a year and each of the 375,000 employees in the firms that he controls would, could each earn $1,000 more. And that would still be market income. So it's pretty clear that markets by themselves are not an objective determinant of your economic contribution. If I can monkey around with it that much, then there's some, there's some, some part of that that is subjective um, and not objective. And once you accept that, then from a moral point of view, there really is no distinction between what I'd call pre-distribution which is monkeying around with the rules and the norms that change market incomes, and redistribution, which is let's leave the norms and the rules alo alone, and we'll just redistribute it afterwards through taxes and transfers. Morally, there's really no difference. You might prefer to do it one way or the other, but um, neither of them is theft. Um, they're both ways that we might want to respond um, to things that we don't like about our system. The third pillar, um, is that we, don't, we shouldn't care about income inequality. All that matters is equality of opportunity, at least from a, from a moral standpoint. And you hear that a lot um, uh, from defenders of markets. The reality is, and I think we all know this, uh, equality of opportunity is unachievable. Uh, the data from social science, it get, gets complicated. I read a lot of it, uh, and I'm gonna summarize it really simply at least half the difference in the market income between you and you, I picked you randomly because that's sort of statistically the way I had to place it, is explained by the result of who your parents were, both in terms of your genes, and I know that's controversial, but also in terms of upbringing, in terms of nature as well as nurture. Yes, we have gone a long way to removing legal barriers that uh, determined wealth and income based on birth order or title or class or race or gender. Yet, even the most well-funded and, and well-meaning institutions can't close this, this irreducible gap. And I give you the example of Harvard University. Uh, which a few years ago had so much money uh, in its endowment, not so much anymore, but in those days so much more money, uh, that they decided to go to needs blind admission, which means that they would admit the best class of students that they could, 
irrespective of who needed what, because they had so much money, it didn't matter. And in fact, if you had to, if you had income below, uh, your family had income below $65,000, and that was back a few years ago, uh, you paid no tuition at all, and that no family would be required to pay tuition of more than 10% of income. And what was the result of that? Basically, that's a perfect meritocratic setup for the arguably the best university in the country. Only 5% of those admitted came from the bottom quintile, the bottom 20% of households by income, and 21%, only 21% came from the bottom 60%. And Harvard actually is now better than other elite schools on that matter. Typically, at those other elite schools, there are more students from the top 1% than there are from the bottom 50%, despite all that scholarship and all that meritocracy. Education, once the great equalizer of opportunity, has in fact now become an instrument of inequality. Indeed, and this actually is not an original idea of mine, um, it's actually a 40, 50 year old idea, as, as the economy becomes more meritocratic, as barriers f for race or gender or class fall away, in a competitive market that only increases the importance of the distinguishing factors that remain. Factors like natural talent, factors like personality traits, which are often inherited or developed early in childhood. So we need to acknowledge the limit of how much we can or even want to equalize opportunity. Maybe some of you have heard of Kurt Vonnegut's uh, dystopic uh, satire, Harrison Bergeron, which I don't think you have on sale here. Uh, nobody reads it anymore, but it's about a society that's fixated on equality of opportunity. Um, and it's in equality of opportunity is enforced by a handicapper general. Um, and the handicapper general insists that all news announcers who are hired have a lisp. <laughs> and that smart people, all smart people have to go around wearing headphones with music blaring in their ears to distract them, which by the way, I think has happened. <laughs> And people who are athletic uh, would have to walk around with backpacks with weights on their back. Um, what Vonnegut shows is that, you know, you want to equalize opportunity, you can get pretty absurd. Of course, if we want to try to equalize things in terms of upbringing, we could take all children away from their parents at birth and send them to state-run uh, boarding schools until they're 17, and that would certainly equalize that but we probably don't want to do that either. And so we're left with a sort of unpleasant conclusion, which is equality of opportunity is, is neither possible nor in fact desirable. And if that's the case, and if we are morally uncomfortable with the fact that Steve Schwartzman earns the same income as 15,000 elementary school teachers, then we can't rely on equal opportunity to solve the problem. We have to address the problem directly. The final argument from free marketeers um, is that it's counterproductive to slice the economic pie into more equal slices because we'll only get a smaller pie. That there's an absolute trade-off between equality and economic efficiency and growth. So I'm going to ask you to think about a thought experiment. Imagine the world in, imagine an economy, closed economy, uh, in which all the income is divided perfectly evenly. Everyone gets exactly the same. Now imagine another world in which all the, output, all the income of the economy goes basically to three guys, and everyone else has a subsistence living. We know that at either of those extreme, the pie gets pretty small. You can ask anyone from Soviet Russia about that first one. Um, it's pretty small. 
But on the other side, you can imagine that it would be pretty small too. Why would anybody actually work hard or take risks um, or share a, a, a new idea with the owner uh, if they were not going to get anything from it? If the three guys who control everything um, uh, continue to get everything. So intuitively, we understand that at the extremes, it's true, there's less growth. And that as you go away from those extremes, you probably get more growth. And there's probably some sweet spot in the middle of this curve at the top that's the nice balance between uh, too much and too little equality. And there's a lot of economic literature on this uh, and uh, too much to recall here. But I wanted to share with you a, uh, uh, an experiment done by a, a, an economist named Richard Friedman. Freeman. He, this is years ago. He divided groups of graduate students. You, for some reason, experimental economics is always done with graduate students um, for reasons that may be self-evident uh, uh, into three groups. And they were each group was told that they were they were supposed to solve some puzzles. But the only thing different about the groups, they were random, was that how they were going to be compensated in terms of the prize money. And in one, uh, the prize money would be distributed perfectly evenly. Everyone would get the same to the winning team. And in the other, it would be a winner take all. Whoever on the team solved the most would get the entire prize. And the third group was some mix of the two. Everyone would get a minimum and then there would be some sort of bonuses for those who solved the most. Well, I think you probably know where this is going. Hands down, the group repeatedly, they did this experiment repeatedly, that did the best was the group that where everyone gets a minimum and there were bonuses. In other words, some sort of mixture. Um, now, why is that the case? Um, why is it that uh, organizations like the IMF, which is not exactly known as a hotbed of radical economic thinking, um, has concluded that the United States and Britain are probably on the wrong side of the sweet spot. That we have much more, we have more room to be more equal without going to the other side of the curve and getting a smaller pie. Um, there are several reasons they give. Um, and there's one that they sort of mention in passing, which I think actually is the most important. Um, and that is that rising inequality depletes the trust that we have in each other and our willingness to cooperate and the trust that we have in institutions. The willingness to sacrifice what's good for me in the short run for what's good for us in the long run. What creates and sustains trust and cooperation, as I said before, is our moral instincts. There simply aren't enough police and courts and lawyers, although in Washington you wouldn't know that, um, and auditors to enforce honesty, reliability, cooperative behavior. We need social, socially enforced norms um, in order for a system to work well. We need to know that when we stand at an ATM machine that the guy behind me is not going to rob me. We need to know that when we go out in the morning to get our newspaper that it's going to be there. We need to know that people line up at the cash register of politics and prose and don't cut in line uh, if there's a line. Um, trust and cooperation provides the grease to an increasingly complex machinery of capitalism. It gives us the confidence to make investments with people who we don't know and don't control, to take risks, to buy products that we've never tried before from people that we don't know. Trust and cooperation also grease the increasingly contentious machinery of democracy that allows government to mediate between competing interests and allows government policy to respond to rapidly changing economic conditions. Now, we don't have great measures of social capital, of trust, um, but we have some. The most famous, actually, I don't know whether you've heard about this, is the old trick that uh, Reader's Digest did. 
they took wallets and they put some money in it along with an address of the so-called owner of the wallets and they left them on the streets in different cities. And, and they had the address and the phone number to see how many people actually returned them, called up and returned the money. And that's one measure of social capital. You can do that over time and you can do it over in diff different distances. We have another measure which is called the general uh, social survey. This question is asked of literally tens of thousands of people around the world every year. And it's a simple question. Uh, agree or disagree, most people can be trusted. Um, maybe or maybe you won't be surprised to know that in the United States, measures of social capital have been going down for the last 30 years and are among the lowest uh, in the advanced countries, though not as low as they are in Italy, uh, I might add. Um, we know that societies with high social capital are healthier, they're happier, and it turns out they're also wealthier. And the erosion of social capital now puts us on the wrong side of that sweet spot. It means that if we want to have faster growth, we need to move toward more equality, not less. So, can American capitalism survive? It's a nice title, it wasn't my choice, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, what was your choice? Why greed is not good, opportunity is not equal, and fairness won't make us poor. But I got the smaller type. <laughs> uh, I think I'd answer the question this way. Uh, the story of the last three decades is a story about a, mo a loosening of the moral and ethical norms by which we establish trust that encourage cooperation. And we've had a serious erosion of social capital. And because of our embrace of this kind of market fundamentalism, the delicate balance between selfish individualism and cooperative altruism that was identified by Adam Smith and Charles Darwin as the key to human progress, that balance has been lost. And the result now manifests itself in a skewed economy, a polarized po politics, and a dysfunctional a dysfunctional government and a social fabric um, that is torn and frayed. And it's been bad for our economy, it's been bad for our politics, and it's been bad for our souls. Thanks. So if you have any questions, I think I'm supposed to tell you to line up at those microphones and, uh, and, uh, and um, we're yeah. looking for questions, not speeches. Uh, do you have an opinion on uh, what uh, Senator Sanders has proposed? I believe he named it after one of your employers, the Bezos Act. Yeah. Uh, that would require lo certain large corporations to reimburse the government for public benefits that are given to their spent on their employees. Uh, in general, my response to things like that is it's sort of a nice instinct. It's a nice idea. I don't think it would be very easy to do that, and I don't think we have to do that. Um, that's sort of a um, – it's, it's sort of punitive, um, and it, it – it, you know, I'm a market guy. You know, I, I want capitalism to work. I want markets to work. And uh, uh, that's a little, uh, there are better ways to do that. We, we need a safety net and we need to pay for that in a progressive way. Um, and it may be that we need to have laws that say you do some things or, you know, a company has to do some things or other things. But um, this notion of, of trying to figure out what the employee, what benefits the employees get, and then calculate that, and then send the bill to the, and to the employer. I, 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 for one thing, it discourages people from hiring um, low wage workers. So I, I don't think the incentive structure is is, is a good idea. Is is right for that. Um, yeah, Stephen, you, most of your talk has been about individual and group uh, methodologies to do natural things, but what happens? How is government regulation, how is the president, how is the Congress affecting this? What things should we Well, work? they're affecting it a lot. They're affecting it a lot. Yes. Um, you know, you want to talk about labor law, you want to talk about antitrust law, you want to, want to talk about securities law. Um, all of those things affect all of these things yes. that we're talking about. But 
for those of you who have this instinct that government is going to solve this, I would tell you that it's much more important that w the intellectual part of it, which is that we conceive of this differently and that we come up with a set of you know, social norms. Where do social norms come from? They don't come from the government. And, and, and the answer is I don't know where they come from. Mm -hmm. um, that's sort of magical. It's some, one of the things that actually uh, academics are looking at quite, quite seriously now, which is where do social norms come from? You know, we had a social norm that to be, to be married, you had to be heterosexual. And then, you know, one day we turned around and that wasn't a social norm. That, that changed very fast. But there are other social norms that take a long time to change. So I can't tell you how we change them. But it's much more important to change the norms. It's much more important for the Steve Schwartzmans of the world to be embarrassed by their thing because we can't write enough laws to make Steve Schwartzman behave the right way. And you know what? As soon as you write them, they'll figure out a way around them and then we'll, get, we'll be in a cat and mouse game. It's, it's sort of more important to think a little more intellectually about, you know, what this thing is called capitalism and what we like about it, what we don't, and talk about it and use social pressure. The, you know, the Me Too movement is probably done a lot more for uh, protecting women from harassment and worse than any laws that we pass. And, and I think it's more important that we not jump to a government solution for everything. Be, not because I'm against regulation, I actually am not, but that's probably, th those should be the last things we think about, not the first things. I completely disagree. I figured um, you would. I remember, I, I'm old enough to remember when we had norms um, and we had social democracy and it was called the New Deal and it worked. Um, and we talked about Keynes and the idea that to have an economy grow, you had to have, you didn't give the investors the money, you made sure that people had enough money to buy things. I mean, they had spent 10 years in the depression, so people understood that. Um, and what changed was the government, the, the New Deal, the uh, labor laws, social security, so older people had money, um, securities regulation, and with it came norms so that uh, George Romney made $300,000 a year running a real company that made real stuff. And Mitt Romney made millions of dollars uh, trading companies. Okay, he didn't so what's produce your, anything. That's your question. And I'm going to answer I mean, it really succinctly, okay. Okay? okay? Which is that I'm almost as old as you are. Um, if, if CEOs in the 1950s and 60s had wanted to, if George Romney had wanted to pay himself more, 300 million rather than right. 3 million or whatever, 300,000, he actually had the power to do that. The boards were more captive back then than they are today. Uh, and he could, he could have done that or whatever was the equivalent back then. He didn't do it. And the reason he didn't do it is if he did it, he would have felt guilty and he would have been socially shamed. And I'm not saying just socially shamed by his workers. He would have been shamed if he went to the, if he went to the country club. In the locker room, the other CEOs would have said, George, that's very picky of you. And it makes all the rest of us look bad. And anyway, we're trying to fight socialism. Uh, and you're going off and paying yourself 300 millions. So it was a social norm that prevented George Romney, not the New Deal, from paying himself $300 million. And his 50% or 60% or 90% income tax. Yeah, nobody paid that. Uh, and that's, that's a sort of a left-wing sort of uh, urban myth that people paid 90% uh, taxes. They didn't. Um, no one was that stupid. Anyone who made that much money was not that stupid to pay 90% taxes. But um, that's what the official tax rate was. But uh, that's not what people paid. They, they, they did pay more than they do now, uh, rich people, but they didn't pay 90%. Uh, had you asked me um, my reaction to your first example of presumably bad corporate behavior yeah. um, and New York Life's decision to outsource its IT services to India, my response would have been, that's globalization. Um, and I'm surprised that you used that example 
um, to illustrate the what you believe the flaws are in American corporate behavior. Um, do you, in fact, um, think we should start slowing the process of globalization, its impacts on the U.S. economy? No. And if so, I how don't. would you go about it? I don't. And, and I gave that example to emphasize the second part of it, which is in order to get your severance, you have to train these guys. That's that's what that's what gets us angry. Okay. It's not the first thing. Okay. It's the second thing. Um, that's not the way you treat a, a, a human being who has been your loyal employee for thirty years. Now it may be you you know you, you have to you have to you have to move your IT operation for competitive reasons there. So I'm not against that. I said to you when I started that these were useful ideas in the 1980s yeah. and one of those was, was rearranging where work was done so that it could be done in the most cheap mm -hmm. and efficient way. But there are ways to treat people and there are other ways to treat people and that was my, that's the example. And that has to do with maximizing shareholder value. Fine, um, I see your point, thank you. And that's taken things too far. Hello. Um, Hi. What I, what I want to ask you about <clears throat> is what you're saying, I agree with most of it, but nevertheless, at this point, I think we have to make like giant steps. And what I'm suggesting is, is that we have to have a public discussion on how we want to format what we do to move forward. In other words, what are the economic factors we have to look at cash flow what it takes to live what the distribution is where the aggregates are mm -hmm. and we haven't in my opinion started as a culture either nationally or internationally to start to do that because if we never get rid of the aggregates in our culture that's power the aggregates meaning what aggregates of wealth aggregates of power um control universities i mean look at everything that goes through yale you cannot, you cannot suggest somebody for anything. I mean, I'm being exaggerating, yeah. but it comes up over and over and over again. Now, what's the reason? Are the, all the smart people there? I, I'm not sure about that. But my point is, we're not analyzing it, at my, in my opinion, quickly enough to project what it might look like where we want to go. Because this is a big, big deal. I guess what I would say to that is we first have to have um, a functional politics. Um, and in order to do that, we have to learn to trust each other a little more and uh, learn to compromise and learn to cooperate. And until we can do that, you really can't fix anything. Um, it's not that we don't, don't have ideas for how we can make things better, but we actually now have very little process to do that and to sort of have the conversation that you're talking about we talk past each other now um or i don't know but when we you know I, I for the last 30 years have been writing about economic policy you know that's my life it it's not worth my time to write about economic policy anymore who am i writing it for you know who, who who's who's gonna do anything um it's, it's a waste of time so until we fix the plumbing um, which includes sort of having a, a different perspective on these things and, and talking more about virtues and a little less about um, income shares. Um, I don't think we can really address this thing. We need to fix the plumbing first. Brother Gould. Uh, hi, Steve. I, I, I um, thought this was the Kate Atkinson talk, but I guess... Uh, uh, so I walked in here, and uh, here we are in a very high microeconomic plane that I hadn't expected. So, yeah. pardon my question. This, it's this guy, be... this guy, by the way, was my college roommate. So, I'm... and it wasn't. I Harvard was going to try to introduce myself as Steve Schwartzman, but I yeah. didn't think that would fly. So, I've, I've been exposed. But um, I'm going to ask you a very specific microeconomic question. I don't know if it's discussed in a book of, of such high. Uh, on such a high philosophical plane, but <laughs> where do you uh, where do you come down on uh, minimum wage laws, especially national minimum wage laws, as opposed to collective bargaining established uh, rates of wages? Uh, 
Well, I, and, I don't. And if you can, this, this and if you can, and if you can comment yeah. also on yeah. on how you feel about the most recent local product of that, the the DC uh, uh, tipped wage yeah. Uh, yeah. act. That's pretty. Yeah. So the last thing is, I don't really understand the tipped wage. I, I'm not smart enough to understand what that bill well, did. We, so we I, can we can talk about right, that okay. afterwards. But minimum wage, earned income tax credit, and and a greater th a greater possibility of unionization are all part of what we would need to do, I think, to change the rules uh, so that the market incomes come out a little more equal. All of those. Some people, by the way, I don't, I'm not going to go too much into this, think earned income tax credit is all you need to do. You don't need to do minimum wage. Some people think $15 minimum wage is what you should do and you don't need to spend so much tax dollars on earned income tax credits. Um, I think actually a combination, they, they each have different perverse incentives and disincentives. And so if you had both of them working together, it would be better. Um, and it would also be better if the possibility of organizing a union were much more realistic. Right now, uh, any company that wants to um, prevent a union from being organized can do so, um, basically. Uh, he's a labor lawyer, so he knows that. You can fire all the people who try to unionize, and they will punish Wait, you. But that, they that, will punish you but that, 15 that's years illegal. later. <laughs> it's illegal, but they'll punish you 15 years later. What's more important, and what used to be true, is that companies that treated employees like that were shunned. In fact, one of the most hopeful things that I see happening um, in the area of companies that are sort of ruthless and always trying to maximize shareholder value is that those companies actually are now having trouble attracting young employees mm -hmm. um, who won't tolerate it. And they won't get good young employees um, if, you, if you behave in that ruthless manner. And, and I think that actually is the most hopeful thing that I have seen. And by the way, that's not a law. That's social norm. Um, whereas employees won't work for companies they think are disloyal and ruthless um, or environmentally uh, irresponsible or treat other employees, uh, you know, in, in that way. So um, that, that to me is, is, is a more important um, uh, way to go and to think about how we encourage that. Yeah, I, I'd submit to you that what we're upset about is that wealthy people in our society don't play by the same rules as we do. And we're not as upset about Steve Schwartzman making $820 million. What we're upset about is that he, li he likely pays the income tax rate at the carried interest rate. That's what we're upset about. Well, that's something. That's obviously a big, uh, that is right. a big deal. But, the, but you know, I, I hate to do this, but I want to yeah. put your employer, the employer up as, as exhibit B, yeah. which is, you know, He's here's not a my company. employer, actually. Okay, but yeah. you're, who owns the company? And that is, here, here you have a company that's asking for public subsidies, and rumor has it that one of them is, we want to keep the withholding tax from the state, that that's part of what's on the block. That rubs us as un that rubs me as very unfair. Good. That's good. Okay. That and you and you're right. That, that, so, I, so I submit to you that it's really a fairness thing, not a, not a social norm. Well, fairness is a social norm. Well, okay. Uh, you know, uh, there are some communities that offered him a lot of money or offered Amazon a lot of money where the politicians had to go back and say, I'm sorry, we were drawing our offer. And why did they do that? Well, they heard from their constituents who were offended by it. Right. But what I'm saying is that they, they're manipulating the laws to, for example, have carry and interest tax rates. And, and so um, therefore what? Therefore, make things transparent so that you don't mind if he makes $820 million, as long as he pays 37.4% or whatever the tax rate is on all amounts above $1.2 million. That's my point. Okay. Well, let me just respond to that by saying you're worried about the, carried in, the tax rate that he pays. I worry more about the fact that his firm earns so much profit above what is a normal profit that the markets he operates in are uncompetitive. And that's a bigger thing to be concerned about. And it does have to do with securities laws and other kinds of laws than worrying about his carried interest benefit, which is, which is outrageous also. But the bigger problem is why does his firm earn enough to pay him that much? Um, and that's the bigger problem um, for not adding that much to the economy. I mean, he's not like he's 
you know, it's not like it's Bill Gates and he invented some great thing that improves all of our lives or something like that, or Facebook, if you think that did. But, um, uh, but uh, he didn't do any, he didn't invent anything. He, he didn't improve, you know, he didn't even write a good book. <laughs> yeah. So th this might be a utopian question or just a stupid question, but I'll ask it anyway. So it, it seems like the, the nature of work is evolving, that there are factories that are being designed with no human work at all, and so with artificial intelligence. So given all of those trends, how does any of that impact on what you're talking about? That, that work will be defined differently, or who does work will be done differently? So there's, in economics these days, there's sort of two camps. Um, one camp worries a lot about artificial intelligence taking all the jobs away. Um, and there's not going to be anything for the, everybody to do, and um, it will make inequality worse. I, I'm just not in that camp. Um, the sweep of, of history and economic history is that we've had those kind of advances. They're lumpy. They do. They do. It's not like it's a nice steady curve. They they do come in waves, um, and the transitions can sometimes be hard. But you know, it's sort of what I teach in in uh, economic principles. If you make the economy more productive, um, it makes the pie bigger. And uh, you might have some issues about how you divide the pie, uh, but um, you know there won't be people in those, in those factories doing those things. But um, I'll give you a little example. I don't know, 20 years ago, if you said I had a personal trainer, everyone would say, oh, wow. Now, I don't know, there's a lot of personal trainers around. So, you know, uh, when we have more money uh, and when we're richer, we find things to do with it. And that often involves service and that often involves people and not robots. And, um, you know, we go out to more restaurant meals. So there's going to be more people working in restaurants. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, uh, you know, is it possible that this is this is a sort of this this is the one time where it won't work? It's possible, but I, I, I don't think so. One more, says oh, no. the boss. Gee, that's, that's a heavy weight. <laughs> um, I remember reading uh, The Rise of the Meritocracy by Michael Young. Yes. About 40 years ago. 40 years. He war warned about meritocracy. He was the, he was the one who warned about he, the and he, toined, and he coined the term meritocracy. Yep, yep. It's brilliant. Do you have that book? I do. Everyone should. I wish you guys give me a list of the people. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been trying to get my book club to read it for 20 years. And you I know, I, I, just, I just reread it. You don't want your book club reading it. Why not? It's really hard to read. Well, yeah, but it's cool. It, I mean, it, it, it reads amazing. very dated. It is, but it's so, he's saying, look at what we did. We and he's a Brit, there. right? He's a, was a Brit, he's wasn't he? Sir Michael, he, he's Sir Michael Young. Yeah, okay. Well, any, anyway, someone already asked about, my first question was going to be about Earned income tax credits yeah. and, and a, a basic, perhaps a negative, negative income tax, a guaranteed income for everybody. Well, I'm for that. If you in the last chapter, I talk about my oh, version great. of the UBI, um, but and it's yeah. more like a negative income tax than it yeah. is the others. But which guess who came up with that one first? But yeah. right, yeah. Brits. No, I thought Nixon did, but anyway. Um, Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman. Yeah. Oh, Milton Friedman. Friedman. Anyway, um, but so, so suppose you did that. Yeah. Do you, would you agree, I think, that a large part of what's going wrong for us now is that people are self-segregating by income because our schools are paid for by real estate taxes? Have you read the book? No. Because you, you know, that's exactly what I think is a big problem. Oh, well, 30 and years ago I worked for a professor at BPI and he was studying that. I think self, but you know, uh, geographic no. segregation in terms of equality of opportunity yeah. The biggest challenge is this, you know, sort of geographic segregation it's, by class. It's disaster. And, you know, it was uh, 1954. How many years ago was that? 54 years ago that the Supreme Court said segregation by race was unconstitutional. And we need new law now. And, you know, I don't think we're moving in that direction this week in the Supreme Court. But uh, uh, we need a court to say segregation by class is also uh, unconstitutional. Well, I just don't even like the fact we say class now. We never said working class. I'm old enough to think. No, we didn't. didn't. We, we were a classless society, even remember? Everybody, even if you were stinking rich, you assumed you were going to try to do something useful. 
Well, I don't know At about least that. I, I don't. A th- handful. I, I don't. I don't think necessarily <laughs> rich people are uh, any more evil than uh, necessarily yeah. they used to. But, but I mean, the but, assumption was you should work anyway. Um, anyway, but uh, the, you made a very good point, which is that that self. First of all, the big sort. There's a book called The Big Sort that probably is here, and you should read it. It's a great book. But we are sorting ourselves by education and income, and. <laughs> And that gets reflected in where we live, and that gets reflected in where our kids go to school. Here's a little data point. The socioeconomic, the average socioeconomic status of the kids in a class is a better predictor of the kid's educational performance than his own or her own economic situation. In other words, if you send rich kids to poor schools, they don't do as well. And if you send poor kids to rich schools, they do better. That the class that they're in, the socioeconomic makeup of the class they're in, is a better determinant, is a, more, is a, is a better predictor of their educational performance than their own families. And th- that tells you that you know, we need to worry about the segregation by class in, in school rooms because uh, it's having a bad effect, um, uh, particularly on poor communities. Thank you very much.